Hi, uh, welcome to the Substrate Seminar on November 3rd. Hopefully it's November 3rd globally. Yeah. Uh, now I, I'm your host, Jimmy Chu here. And we're glad to see our old friends, uh, Joshi Ondorf uh, from Pure Stake, uh, to share two different concepts that he encountered uh, during uh, his work in Moon, on Moonbeam. So one is a Moonbeam dual parachain standalone runtime, and another one is a, about the front end, a frontier block import. Uh, so this presentation will be particularly relevant for anyone building a parachain. Yeah. Uh, if actually if we have time, uh, Josh probably has more interesting things to share with us. So yeah. Yeah, I'm happy uh, to talk about anything that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll pass the time uh, to Josh. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. So um, it's cool to be on the seminar on the presenter side, and I'm excited to talk about some of the stuff I've seen on the Moonbeam project since I started working at Pure Stake, which has been like um, not a month yet, but getting pretty pretty close to a month. And uh, yeah, so we're just gonna we're gonna talk about those two topics, and I guess a good way to dive in is for me to just kind of give like a little bit of context and overview about what Moonbeam is, and then like when we get to the relevant parts, then we can stop and like look at code and everything. Um, and so like, you know, Jimmy, I know you did a little prep work for this, so feel free to like interject questions anytime. I love that, I really like questions. And then everybody in the audience, same thing, there's that like ask a question button. So any any question is welcome. On topic is great, you know, close to topic is fine too. Um, so, okay, here's a link and it's to this, thing I've been working on that's called the Frontier Workshop. And it's definitely not done, but it's it's done enough that we can look at it a little bit and get some value from it today. And I'll just share my screen and look at that too. Uh, wait, did that work? Can you see my screen, Jimmy? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. I see oh there wait now it looks like it worked okay cool yeah I don't know what was up with that but good glad it's there. oh I, I, I'm managing the screen here oh cool okay oh awesome yeah okay cool thanks Jimmy um so here's here's the frontier workshop um I know some of you guys have done the cumulus workshop which has been popular lately and um along with some other guys I had written most of that and so this one kind of follows the the same format. And so basically what the workshop does is it takes you from a starting point of the substrate node template and it walks you through installing all of these different pieces of a project called Frontier. And um, Frontier is a set of uh, a lot of different stuff, um, pallets mostly, and also some non-runtime code that makes substrate work as an Ethereum compatible chain. And so, like Jimmy said, I work at PureStake and we're the team building Moonbeam. So I'm focused mostly on Moonbeam. And our goal with Moonbeam is to be a Polkadot parachain that has all this Frontier stuff installed so people can deploy their Ethereum smart contracts to Moonbeam or, you know, like more abstractly to the Polkadot ecosystem without having to like rewrite them or anything like that. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through like the steps of this workshop. I actually did that um, at my Sub-Zero presentation. So you could go back and watch that if you want to, but I, I am gonna kind of flip through it just to talk about our architecture. So, um, oh wait, I thought there was supposed to be an image there. Hold on. Hmm. Okay, there we go. So the, the diagram here is basically like the architecture of a substrate node. The gray part is an individual node. Um, and then the arrows going in and out represent data coming in and out of the node. And I guess like the most natural spot to start is the runtime. And that's just because like, I think a lot of people work in the runtime and it's where like some of the interesting stuff about Frontier happens. And it's a good, it's a good spot to do it actually because we're, that'll build us up to our first topic of like Moonbeam's dual purpose runtime. So, um, okay, yeah, so, so here's a substrate node and you know, the runtime has a bunch of pallets in it. System is always there, balances is not strictly necessary, but is typically there. And then there's some other ones, like there's the timestamp pallet. And uh, at the moment we have the pseudo pallet, obviously that won't be in, in mainnet. Um, and then I showed this one here, the EVM pallet. This one's one that's sort of new, uh, or it's unique to Frontier, I guess. And what it does is it contains an entire EVM, an Ethereum virtual machine, this thing that's capable of like executing um, bytecode that runs on Ethereum. 
and it puts it in the substrate runtime. And so what that means is if you have some EVM bytecode, like maybe you got it by compiling a solidity contract or something, then you can deploy it to this EVM that's in the substrate runtime and it will like, you know, execute transactions and calls into that, uh, into that contract. It's only a small part of the story though, because this is like just the raw EVM. It doesn't do any of the other stuff that Ethereum does. Like, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with how transactions are encoded or anything like that. Um, it definitely doesn't, you know, have anything to do with like uh, Ethereum blocks or, or those kinds of data because, you know, like the EVM lives inside the blockchain, not the other way around. And so this is this is a great start, but it's not everything. And maybe it makes more sense for me to just kind of continue on to the next part to tell you what comes from there. Uh, so maybe quest any questions so far, I guess. Uh, I didn't see one. OK, cool. So I'll just keep going. So the next thing in our runtime is this palette, the palette Ethereum. So what it does is it's all about data encoding. So basically with Moonbeam and you know with, with Frontier in general, what we're trying to do is make it so that people who are used to using a real Ethereum chain, like the mainnet, for example, or ETH Classic or Rinkaby or whatever, can deploy their contracts to Moonbeam like the same old way using MetaMask or Truffle or whatever. And what that means is like we need to be able to accept these raw pieces of binary data that are just like straight up Ethereum encoded transactions. And the way in theory, Ethereum encodes transactions is different than how Substrate does it. And so that's what this Ethereum palette is all about. It, it basically allows um, like data conversion and wrapping in both directions. And so what I mean by both directions is you can submit Ethereum transactions and Palette Ethereum helps Substrate understand how to interpret those Ethereum encoded transactions. And then you can also do the other kind of thing. You can say like, hey, give me a transaction receipt for this particular transaction or like tell me the data at Ethereum, this particular Ethereum block hash. And you know, again, Ethereum block hashes are different than substrate block hashes. So that's what this palette's all about. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and we'll, we'll dig deeper into how that works in a little bit, but I think that's like enough about the specifics of our runtime for now that we can start to dive into the, um, the, like, the dual runtime. Oh, before that, uh, I think there are some questions here. Oh, sure. Yeah, what do we got? What's what the difference the between Moonbeam and Plasm, Plasm Network? Oh, okay, great, great question. I think I honestly don't know that much about Plasm uh, Network. I've I've met Soda, one of the guys who works on it, um, but I honestly don't feel like I can answer that. But I, what I can tell you is what what Moonbeam is, and it's just a platform where um, you know if you have a DAP written in Viper or Solidity and a deployment process using Truffle or like whatever your tools are, bring it right on over. It works on Moonbeam with compatibility not being your problem. That's what we're solving. Plasm might do something different, but honestly, I don't know. So sorry, I can't answer that. Actually, Jimmy, do you know? Uh, I don't. I don't. OK, I, I, all right, I, cool. I think they're building, building bridges uh, between like their, their, their own mainnet and Ethereum. Yeah, that sounded a little bit familiar. I remembered something about, uh, oh, look, Sam actually knows in the, um, in the troll box here, uh, Plasma is a side chain, Ethereum, Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so there's the this like plasma standard, and then there's this plasm network that is in the Polkadot ecosystem. They're, I think they're interesting, but I'm just not that oh, up to speed. Plasma and plasm, yeah, they're different things. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So okay, next question: What's the difference between EVM palette and Ethereum palette? So the e, uh, the EVM palette is just this abstract state machine. So like another similar analogous example is this uh, like contracts palette that ships with substrate that gives you like a wasm state machine that you can execute smart contracts on or like i used to work on this thing called our chain they had like the row vm so it's just some abstract virtual machine that you can execute code on and then palette ethereum is all about data compatibility it's about taking ethereum formatted data and making it understandable to substrate node and also vice versa oh so the ethereum like the state is stored in the ethereum palette uh, in the, no, the Ethereum state is stored in the, the EVM palette, like the state of all the contracts and all of that stuff. So, so like the EVM, if you think of it, you know, it's a virtual machine, right? If we think about it as like, uh, you know, a machine, like you might think of it as having like some storage disks or something right. like that. And all of that stuff is in the, the EVM palette. 
what the what the ethereum palette does is like so okay so to execute a transaction on substrate you know there's this type like extrinsic and you submit an extrinsic and there's an analogous thing in ethereum but they're like they're not the same and so we just need to convert back and forth between them and so that's what palette ethereum does for us okay and I'll actually dig into the code a little bit and show you how how that works because it's really interesting and that will actually motivate um, like our discussion about the frontier block import. But it's that's actually not like super necessary for the dual runtime thing. So maybe we'll tackle that one first. Um, so oh yes, the troll box is alive with with plasma talk. I love it. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, let me actually just t like take us into the Moonbeam repo and show you around a little bit. And like, can you see my terminal and stuff, Jimmy? Yes, I, I can. Okay, sweet. That's great. Um, okay, so here's the Moonbeam repo and we'll just sort of clean it up so we're starting from a fresh start. And you know what else I'll do? I'll show you where this thing is. So it's uh, github.com pure stake Moonbeam. Here's the link. So um, we've got a couple folders here, and you know some of them are this like stuff that's not directly related to the node, like VS Code and Docker and that kind of stuff that's like important but not Rust code, not what we're talking about right now. And then we see these three folders that are probably really familiar because they came straight from the node template. So we've got palettes, and we have some palettes in there that we're you know kind of sketching out ideas about, but we're not we aren't using those yet. And then we've got runtime, which is you know where our runtime typically lives. And then we've got node. And I want to just show you inside this node folder, we have two folders in here, the parachain node and the standalone node. And a lot of parachain development teams are in this same situation where they want to have a parachain node that uses cumulus and you know cumulus consensus and service and all of that kind of stuff so that it can work with like Rokoko or their local relay chain testnet. Um, but then they also want a standalone node because it's just so darn convenient to do like Moonbeam dash dash dev when you're, you know, debugging stuff or writing tests and all, all of that. And, you know, and some of these teams, I, I don't think Moonbeam has decided about this yet, but some of the teams are actually launching a standalone chain first and then will convert to a parachain later on once parachains are ready. And so they really don't have any option but to have two nodes. So that's kind of just like the, the state of the world for parachain developers. And so we have these two different nodes and they have slightly different runtime requirements. The runtimes are similar, you know, like in our case, all of that palette EVM and palette Ethereum stuff. And like when we get our tokenomics stuff finished in that palettes directory, all of that important stuff is going in both versions of the runtime. It's going in both standalone and parachain runtime. But there are a few things that are specific to one or the other. So like in our standalone node, we need like grandpa and aura palettes, for example. Um, and in our parachain node, we need the like message broker and toker deal and dealer, token dealer and all that like cumulus -y kind of stuff. And so they're not identical. And so the way that many parachains have dealt with it so far is to just have two totally separate runtimes. But the problem with that is that most of the code is duplicated and du duplicated code is bad because it means more work every time you want to change it. And it also means like you have the possibility for it to accidentally go out of sync. You know, like maybe you find a small bug and you go in and fix it, but you forget to fix it in both places or something. And so one of my first tasks when I started at Moonbeam was to try to solve that code duplication problem. And I experienced that in Substrate Recipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, say, say that again. What was that? Oh, About we kind of experienced that uh, when we were doing the Substrate Recipe. Yeah, totally. So when I was working on the Dev Hub team with Jimmy, we were the two main recipes guys. Now now it's Jimmy. And yeah, we, we had the same problem. Like so much of the runtimes we wanted to have duplicated across the nodes and it's just challenging. Um, so, all right. So there's two different approaches that I've seen. Um, and one is the approach that's taken in Polkadot. And, you know, Polkadot has like the main Polkadot runtime, but then it also has like the Kusama and West End and Rokoko runtime. And I think it even has like some test runtimes and, um, and, and stuff like that. And what they've done there, well, let's just look at it actually. Um, Parity Tech Polkadot. And they have this runtime folder. 
And so here's the folders for all of the different runtimes that I was just talking about, West End, Rococo, et cetera. And then each one of these, like if we just look at the Kusama one, each one looks normal. It has this Wasm Builder thing, and then it has like uh, a LibRS file. So we're like looking at the Kusama runtime right now. And you can see, you just go through this and like, okay, here's the runtime version. You know, this one's Kusama, et cetera. And um, like, okay, here's the frame system trait and here's the another palettes trait and another palettes trait. And if we go down far enough, we'll find construct runtime. There's a lot of palettes in here. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a complex runtime. Uh, oh, I must I have missed construct runtime. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just use these fancy tools from the 21st century. Oh. Yeah, so there it is, okay. And then, you know, we go down even a little bit further and then there's like the runtime API stuff. So the point is this Kusama runtime is like a standard runtime. Um, and then it would be the same thing if I flipped through any of these, the Polka out of the Rokoko ones. And then they, they do have this thing called common where, you know, whatever parts can be abstracted away are. Um, so I think this lib file is just re-exports mostly. Oh yeah, all the, the like uh, the common constants, that's a great thing to abstract out, you know? Um, like the maximum block weight or like, I don't know if the min block time is in here. That's something that maybe could go in here. Um, but the point is there's still a lot of duplicated code. And so we thought about going this way and we still might, you know, the, the way I'm going to show you that we did it is like not totally perfect, but for now we're, we're using a different technique than what they've done here in Polkadot. And the idea is that like we wanted to deduplicate our code to a greater extent than they did. And so we, we made a different design decision that has some sort of different consequences. Um, so the, the pro of what we did is that there is less duplicated code. The, the sort of the cost, I don't know if it's a con yet, but the cost is we had to introduce a second cargo workspace. And so I guess maybe like before I talk about it, like super abstractly, we can just dive into the code and take a look. Right. So, okay, so we're in our runtime palette. I don't know how to make this left panel bigger, so sorry, but you'll be able to see really soon. And so there's three files here. There's lib.rs, which contains the majority of it, and then there's parachain.rs and standalone.rs. And um, I guess let's start in lib.rs. That seems like a, a good place to jump in. So I have these comments here. So like, Here's the Moonbeam runtime. It powers both our standalone node and our parachain node. And by default, if you just build it with the default features, then it builds the parachain runtime. So to enable the standalone runtime feature, then, oh yeah, we use this thing called a Rust feature that's called standalone. Um, and I'll tell you uh, like a little bit more about Rust features as we go. But the, the basics of Rust features, or I guess maybe it's car cargo features is the right way to say it. It's more of a cargo thing. Um, is that when you compile something, you can compile it with uh, flags like dash dash features standalone or whatever. And you've see, probably seen this in Substrate because they do this trick all the time. This one actually, it's right here on the screen where they have a feature to build each palette and each runtime uh, to like STD. So we have this feature called STD, and then if it's enabled, we build like all this, you know, here's an example like we compile this line, but if it's not built to STD, then we don't compile this line. And so cargo features are used in a lot of projects where there's some like basic core functionality. And then there's some fancier thing that some people want, but it makes the compile take longer and means there's more dependencies and everything. And so like, if you don't need that feature, you shouldn't compile it in because then your binaries will be lighter and have fewer dependencies and all that kind of stuff. So, Cargo features is the technique that we've used here in order to make this single piece of runtime code support both our standalone and our parachain nodes. And so I guess like maybe I'll pause right there and then uh, and then I'll, I'll show how it worked if there are questions or whatever. Um, yeah. No questions no, yet. Okay. No. All right, cool. We'll keep them coming. If you have questions, that's fine. Um, and I guess maybe just for a little bit of context, I want to give you guys the link to the pull request where I did this. and. Uh, to cargo features. So that was um, pure stake, moonbeam, poles, and I'll just find it. Hmm. Oh, it might not even be on that page anymore. I am pasting it here. There. Oh, you got, did you get it already? Okay, nice. 
Yeah, cool. Yep, that's the one. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, good. Um, and then here's also the link about cargo features. So, um, yeah, so these, these docs are actually really good. Like I knew cargo features was a thing and I had seen it for that STD feature that I had just talked about, but I hadn't really like fully understood how to use it to our advantage. And so like there's this section called features in everybody in every cargo.toml and this example crate has, you know, like this go faster feature and it has like a secure password feature. And what we see here is that like, if you want to use the secure password feature, then we have to have this additional dependency on, on the bcrypt library. Um, and yeah, and, and oh, another thing you can see is like, if you wanna build with this session feature, then one of our dependencies also has a session feature that we wanna enable and, you know. Um, so that's an example. So let's go look at how it, it works in Moonbeam. So here's the Moonbeam code, and I guess maybe I'll start in our cargo.toml. So it starts out really normal, you know, this is the Moonbeam runtime, here's uh, like our homepage and everything. Um, oh, sorry. And then here's the dependencies, it starts out really normal, you know, these are in like most substrate runtimes, and then here's a bunch of substrate dependencies. Uh, ours is a little bit unique because we're doing a parachain, so we have all these cumulus dependencies also. And now at the bottom, now we're at this relevant part here, okay? So this is the features section. And every substrate runtime has this part where there's a default feature, or like this is where you list what features are the default ones. So when you build it without explicitly saying any features you want, which ones get built. And so STD is a default feature. And maybe just to dig in on that, now that we're talking about cargo features in detail, the way that this STD feature works is it says, if so here's the std feature and it says basically like if you're compiling this runtime to support std then all of its dependencies also have a feature called std and they have additional capabilities so whenever we're building the runtime to std then also build these additional dependencies okay so that's the part that might be familiar here's the new part we add this feature called standalone oh that looks ugly that should be like that and Standalone has a few additional dependencies. And so we say, if we're building this runtime with the standalone feature, then and only then include the dependency on palette aura and the aura primitives and on palette grandpa, because the parachain runtime doesn't need those. And um, since, you know, I showed you that comment earlier that when you just build the runtime by default, we've chosen to be sort of like parachain first. So when you build it by default, it builds the parachain runtime. And so the parachain only dependencies like the token dealer and some other ones, uh, like the message broker and upward message and everything, those are compiled always. Those are not in the standalone feature. So um, let's look at like, okay, here's the standalone feature. It has this dependency on palette aura. And so the last piece of how you set up your cargo toml file is that when you include the actual dependency on palette aura, this one, then you have to put optional equals true. And the, the reason that you put that is because if I'm just building this thing for the parachain, I don't even need palette aura, so I don't wanna list it as a required dependency here. So that's the cargo.toml part of it. And so now we can look at our code. So it starts out like, uh, let's see, let me find a good place to show you one of these. Here's a perfect example, okay. So in our runtime code, there's this thing, this like module called opaque, and it's where we declare a couple types that are like uh, opaque extrinsic and stuff like that. And basically what it means when we call a type opaque in substrate is that we're, call we're saying like extrinsic or unchecked extrinsic is some very specific type. It's like a struct in substrate and it has fields and all of that kind of stuff. But when we call it opaque extrinsic, it means we're treating it just as a vector of bytes. And so whatever the actual unchecked extrinsic is, we're serializing it somehow, in this case with the scale codec, and then opaque extrinsic is just some series of bytes that's assumed to be able to decode into an unchecked extrinsic. So the, the part about opaque, I guess, was kind of a tangent, but that's just the context we're in right now. And so part of this opaque module is that you, you use this substrate macro called impl opaque keys, and then whatever session keys you use are declared here. So in, in the Moonbeam runtime, 
when we're building for standalone, we actually do have two session keys, just like the node template. We have session keys for Aura for block authoring and for Grandpa for finalization. But neither of those are present when we're building to the parachain, um, like the parachain version of the runtime, I should say. And so the session keys thing is empty up here. And these lines are the ones that I point out. So like this line 118 that I have highlighted right now, it says only compile the following code if we're building with the standalone feature. So if we're not building with the standalone feature, the compiler acts like that whole blob of code is like just literally not even there. And then we also feature gate the, the other version and we say only build this one if we're not building the standalone feature. And so that basically means like uh, not standalone therefore must be parachain. Um, and so then we do the empty session keys. So yeah, yeah, maybe any questions so far? Uh, there's one here. Okay, oh cool, yeah, let's take a peek. In all dependency, we most of the time mention default features equal false. So if STD is included, it will enable that default features that we disable when including the dependency. Yeah, that's exactly right, Sam. Exactly right. So the runtime by, you know, here I was just talking about how like the Moonbeam runtime is parachain first. And so that means when we just build the default features, we're building the parachain runtime. Well, the convention in Substrate is that all runtimes are like no STD first. So when you, or no, sorry, I said that wrong. They're like STD first. So when you just build them with the default features, you're building them to STD. And then when we want to build it to no STD, uh, then, you know, we disable that ST, the default features. And so that's why we have this default features equals false all the time. So yeah, really good question and like really good conceptual connection. So, okay. So back to where we were, like I, I wanted to start with this one because I feel like this is just a really clear example of like feature gating different pieces of code. And I actually scrolled past a few of them because they were just a little bit less insightful. But now that we know the basics, we can go back and look at them. Um, and so there's, there's two of them. And the first one is like this thing mod standalone. So I showed you we have three files, lib.rs, that's what we're in now. That's the common, like the main runtime file that has all the common code, which is most of it. And then there's this parachain.rs and standalone.rs. And so what, what these lines are saying is like, we're always gonna use exactly one of those modules, not both. And like, depending on whether we're building the standalone feature or not, that tells which of the modules we're gonna pull in. Um, and then same thing for the use uh, statements. And then so like I, what I told Jimmy for his like prep work was just search for the word standalone here in this file and you'll see like the interesting parts. So that's when we talked about, um, okay, yeah, great. Here's another one. So we have this palette Ethereum. I told you guys about that one already. And it's the one that does Ethereum compatibility. And one of the associated types, well, actually the only interesting one now that I look at it, that we needed when we configure Palette Ethereum is this thing called find author. So if you know about Ethereum, you know that um, in an Ethereum block, it, in, it contains a field called miner, whoever mined that block. And, you know, miner is, it's called miner because Ethereum started out proof of work and mainnet still is. But there's all these other networks, you know, POA, test nets and private nets and everything. And the field's still called miner, but it's basically just been generalized to mean like the block author now. So what we do with Palette Ethereum is we say like, okay, people are going to call this palette asking for Ethereum blocks. We need to know what to put into that miner field. It needs to be like whoever was the author of this block. And so in Substrate, there's, there's some traits that help with that. And um, basically, we're telling Palette Ethereum here, how are you going to figure out who authored this block? And we're saying, well, that depends. What you do is going to be different depending on where, whether we're using the standalone runtime or not. If we're using the standalone runtime, that means we're using Aura to author blocks. So just go ahead and ask the Aura palette who authored this block and use that data in the minor field. But if we're, uh, you know, building the parachain node, we don't have Aura there. So we can't ask the Aura palette who authored the block. So we hooked it up for now to this thing called Phantom Aura. And what Phantom Aura does, I forget where that code is. I, uh, it might be in, I thought it was in here, but it's, it's not. Is, I don't it see it, but... is it more or less act as a placeholder? Yeah, exactly. It just stubs that out. It, what it returns is always like 0x0000. Zero 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 zero. So the minor field just says, you know, zero all the time. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so so like that's just another example of conditionally compiled code. So here's the sort of like probably the most interesting part of the conditionally compiled code. It's this single macro called runtime standalone or runtime parachain. And these are taking the place of like, you know, normally construct runtime would go here. And uh, so what, what we're doing instead of calling construct runtime here directly is we're calling into this, uh, you know, this macro runtime standalone. And the, the place that comes from is these other two files. This is what we used at the top with those other conditionally compiled parts. So let's just take a look at the one for this for standalone first. Um, so here's the start of the macro. You know, we define our macro here. And it's a very simple macro. It takes no input parameters. We saw that already when we called it. And it just expands into this exact blob of code up here. So one thing that's specific to the standalone runtime is like, you know, the, the name of this string and it'll have its own versioning and everything. I think the other one's called Moonbeam Parachain. Um, obviously like the Aura and Grandpa palettes are necessary. And this is weird like kind of funny code. So, you know, when you're constructing a substrate runtime, you're always like impulse some particular trait for runtime. But this runtime struct is declared by the construct runtime macro. So one funny thing is you can't like have this info palette grandpa trait for runtime in a different file than where construct runtime is unless you do some like macro -y stuff it's itself. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, like obviously we're just doing all of this uh, like standalone specific stuff. And then finally, here's our call to construct runtime. So we have like, uh, obviously the Ethereum and EVM palettes, that's our main like business logic kind of stuff. And then we also have these palettes that were only going to be included in the standalone runtime. So for comparison in the parachain.rs, it's really similar. There's a macro, you know, it doesn't take any parameters. It constructs the version just like before. Yeah, Moonbase Alpha Net is what this one's called. And then it implements the traits for, for these other, you know, parachain only palettes. And then at the bottom, uh, oh yeah, here's where Phantom Aura is defined. That actually makes sense because we're not using Phantom Aura in the standalone runtime. So it, it lives here. It's only necessary for parachain. And here's where you can see like it just returns zero every single time. So it doesn't even make any effort to like um, try to find the author of the block. And then construct runtime, it's the same thing, you know, like here's our main business logic. We don't have Aura and Grandpa anymore. We just have all of these like parachain-y kind of ones, parachain info and token dealer and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, well, let me pause for questions there. And then I just have a couple more things to say about that, I guess. Oh, okay, no questions right now. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess the, like the last thing that I'll say is that I, you know, Jimmy, you, you know this, because as we mentioned, we were talking about it in the context of the recipes, but there's this, um, there's this inconvenience about construct runtime. And I'll just show you what the sort of like ideal thing to do would be in, in my opinion. And this is sort of what Jimmy and I talked about. Whoops, that didn't work. That's because we oh, cannot uh, add the conditional, like, like we cannot add the features inside the construct. Yeah. Runtime. Yeah, exactly. So here's, Here's what I just copied from our parachain runtime. And so what I'd really love to do is take this conditional thing and say like, only build this code if it's not, you know, the standalone feature. And I would love to slap that code just like, um, you know, right here and uh, like just before each one of these palettes that we don't want. The trouble is we're inside of a macro here. And so you can't just put like arbitrary valid rest code. You have to, the macro needs to know how to parse these and the construct runtime macro doesn't currently know how to parse these like conditional compilation things. And so we, we talked to the developer at parity who sort of like is the primary maintainer of these macros. And he basically said like, uh, that would be a lot of extra work and like, it's probably not worth it in this case. So just do it the way I, I showed you to do, but that was just sort of like the, this was sort of like the um, design that we had hoped for when we were first talking about that, that feature. So that's pretty much like what I have to say about the, the dual runtime thing. The, the punchline is like it's cargo features and that, that's the, the secret. Um, 
So yeah, I, I can take any questions about that. And then otherwise we can just sort of keep going through the Moonbeam architecture and get to the frontier block import. Okay. All right, what do you think, Jimmy? Should we move on? Sure, sure. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to this, um, oh, not that. Oh, uh, I wanted to do, actually, there's yeah. a question. Like, it is about like tangential to, to what you say. Okay, like, oh um, yeah, that's fine. When we are running a EVM in, in the substrate and compare it with like running the EVM like natively in the Ethereum chain, like how is the performance comparison? Uh, anyone like? Yeah, that's a good question. So like, let me, I, I don't know like numbers, so I can't answer that like super directly, but I can tell you like a little bit of context about how to think about that. So there's this, um, there's this crate, uh, this one, it's published on crates.io and it's called EVM. And this thing is written by Wei Tang. He's a developer at Parity. He's the, he, this, this guy, Sorpes is, is uh, his GitHub username. And uh, so, so he writes this thing and I believe that Sputnik VM was also used or maybe even is used in Ethereum Classic. Uh, but it, it existed before Palette EVM. So when Palette EVM was written, mainly what it is is a wrapper around this already existing EVM. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like the performance of the underlying EVM, you know, you can benchmark this thing and it's the same as any other chain that runs this EVM. The one additional thing to keep in mind though is that in many cases, we're going to be executing this thing in WASM. And so all the same like performance penalties that you typically pay with WASM are associated here too, you know? And I, I don't honestly have any good benchmarking data on that. I'm sure Sean or like uh, Sergey would know a ton about it, but I seem to like vaguely remember like a five to one performance hit or something like that. Five to, uh, what does it like, mean? Uh, uh, I, I, like I, for some reason I remember that like executing the runtime code in WASM was like five times slower than oh. native or something. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I, but honestly, like, don't quote me on that. I just have a vague memory of it. I'm sure there's people in Substrate Technical who like know the real numbers and and stuff. So, yeah, that that's a good question. Thanks for that question, Jimmy. So, okay, so our next topic is um, it's it's about this thing called the Frontier Block Import, and there's a really good knowledge base article about block imports in general. Jimmy, maybe you can like drop that one. It's like it's really good background reading. So I'll give you some basics as we go. Um, but uh, if you care about this stuff or like if you're trying to actually do this, definitely you should read that background article. So, okay. So I'm back, I'm following this like workshop that I was, that I am writing again. And so we've gotten through adding the EVM and the Ethereum palettes to our runtime. And um, there's like a little bit more that happens in the runtime. And uh, I guess I'll just show you for context. Um, there's this struct here called convert transaction. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if this is like too in the weeds to really be worth talking about, but, uh, it, it creates this, uh, unit struct. So basically just a type with, with no like encapsulated data and it's called transaction converter. And we're going to use this struct in order to implement this particular convert transaction trait on it. And this is all about converting. So like, okay. It's called convert transaction. And what it takes in is an Ethereum style transaction. And what it gives back is this substrate type called unchecked extrinsic. And so basically what happens is when a user of Moonbeam calls in and says, I would like to execute this Ethereum style transaction, this thing, we need, we want to use all of Substrate's normal like transaction queuing and prioritizing and executing logic. We don't want to like recode all of that. It exists in Substrate and Substrate's implementation is really good and robust. And so we want to use that. And so what we do is we take this transaction that the user passed in, it's right here, and we wrap it in a call um, to Palette Ethereum. So you can see we're calling into Palette Ethereum and we're calling its transact function. And so in Palette Ethereum, whenever one of these like um, unsigned extrinsics comes into this transact function, what we actually do is we take out the underlying Ethereum transaction and we extract, uh, like extract the signature and check the signature and do all the normal transaction processing. But this ability to wrap transactions is like what allows us to use all of Substrate's normal, like, um, I don't know, just transactional, transaction handling and plumbing and like queuing logic exactly as it is. 
So the final piece we install in the runtime is a runtime API. And there's really good docs about this too. I know there's at least a recipe and maybe a knowledge base article. Essentially a yeah. runtime API is, a, a, yeah, you can share those uh, too, if you like. Yeah. What, what is the, so unchecked transaction. So it means that the data may not be valid. That's why it's called unchecked. Yeah, it, right, exactly. It means we haven't done the like preliminary checking for this extrinsic. We haven't like made sure it has a valid signature and valid nonce and like um, I think funds to pay the transaction fees might be part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so we still check it. Like we're going to check it eventually later in the pipeline, like when we're including it in a block and everything. Okay. Yeah. So, or actually, yeah, now that I think about it, it will get checked in the pool as well, which is really cool. So like, the substrate transaction pool has the ability to, for any given transaction, call into the runtime and say like, runtime, is this thing valid? Should I even bother to like keep it in the pool and maybe try to put it in a block? And it's smart enough to do that for the Ethereum transactions too. Let me show you some of this code actually. So, oh yeah, so I need to get to the Frontier repo now because Pallet Ethereum is part of the Frontier repo. Uh, oh, I'm in it already, okay. And uh, so there's this, let's see. Or is it? So yeah, frame, Ethereum, source, lib, okay. Um, so let me just find the, the valid part. Well, here's something I can show you while we are here. We have this inside of Deco module, we have this function called transact. And this is where we process like an Ethereum transaction. And you can see it says like ensure none. And that means that this thing is gonna come in as an unsigned extrinsic. And that, you know, that's like, unsigned from the perspective of substrate because substrate node is just getting this blob of bytes it has no idea what they are definitely it's not like a signature field that substrate knows how to deal with but it does still have an ethereum style uh signature so that's why we do stuff here where we're like um uh, somehow we like dig out the oh yeah here it is self recover signer of the transaction so like this recover signer thing, it's something that knows how to deal with Ethereum style transactions. And so we get the source and then, you know, we make sure it's valid and otherwise we error out. So this is where the like normal signature checking stuff is. Um, but that's actually not even why I came here. I came here to show us this, uh, this stuff about the unsigned extrinsic. So let me find that. I think we, I saw the un validate unsigned, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, validate unsigned is what I was looking for. Thanks. Um, so this is this is the part that the transaction pool can call into and say, like, hey, runtime, I heard of some particular transaction. It's unsigned. Uh, you know, I either got it like through RPC or across the network from another node, and I just want to know if this thing might be valid. And if it's not, I'm throwing it away. I'm not bothering to to keep it around. And so the substrate framework is flexible enough that like your palette can explain and codify how you're supposed to validate one of these things. So, um, you know, like one thing that we have to do is just check whether the nonce is valid. Another thing we have to do is check whether there's enough fees, enough money to pay the fees and, um, and et cetera. And if it's invalid, we return that. And otherwise then, you know, we just tell the thing that it's valid and we give it a priority and, um, and it gets handled in all the ways that normal transactions get handled. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, uh, don't, that's not what I was looking for. We're done with all of that. Here's, wait, here's the part I was looking for. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, right. So the runtime API allows parts of the node that are not the runtime to call into the runtime and ask specific questions. So in this, runtime API that we're looking at, the node could call into the runtime and say like, hey, runtime, what's our chain ID? Or like, tell me some basic info about this particular account, like what's their balance and their nonce and stuff like that. Or like, tell me what the min gas price is going to be for the next block or, you know, just that kind of stuff. Um, here's one that uses the author. It like, you know, uses that find author trait we talked about earlier. So, so this is where the data from Palette Ethereum is finally going parts of the node outside of the runtime are going to call in to the runtime through this API and ask questions that either the EVM palette or the Ethereum palette will be able to answer for us. And specifically, the parts of the node that are going to do that is like the RPC handler. So the, the big picture data flow is like a human user uses a tool like Truffle to query the node 
saying like, tell me um, the storage at some particular contracts, you know, some particular storage item. And so that goes into the RPC handler. The RPC handler calls into this runtime API and this runtime API calls into pallet EVM, which as we talked about earlier is where all the contract storage is. And so that's like the overall data flow. And uh, so, yeah, so we installed this, uh, this runtime API. I'll, I'll show you where it is in the Moonbeam runtime. So here's Moonbeam and here's our runtime. And uh, so down below construct runtime, this is the part that people don't look at as often. There's this macro called impl runtime APIs. And there's always a bunch of standard ones. SP API uh, core is like the main, main one. There's always metadata. There's always block builder. There's always transaction pool. Uh, there's often off-chain worker, but that depends if you want to use those. Um, there's always session key. I don't need to look through every single one of them. Uh, this is the one that we're looking for. Ethereum runtime RPC API. That's the one that I was implementing. And so, um, well, this is the same code I showed you, but this is where it goes down at the bottom where you're implementing all these runtime APIs. And, uh, and this is a cool thing. Like you can create your own runtime API so that your node can ask your runtime like arbitrary specific questions that you like. So there's a recipe about that as well that's worth looking into. Um, so what I was trying to get to here is this, the block import. Um, oh yeah, and this, so like understanding the purpose of why we're doing this is, is really important. So if you remember, I was explaining the data flow saying, like human users call into the RPC asking questions like, tell me the storage at this particular storage item at this particular block. So like, you know, what's my token balance as of block 55 or something? Um, or, you know, sometimes they'll specify it as a block hash and the block hash is actually a really good example of why we need this whole block import thing. So imagine a user calls up the substrate node and says like, tell me something about this particular block hash and the block hash that they give is an Ethereum formatted block hash. And what that means is the substrate node doesn't actually know how to handle that block hash. If we just like naively pass the Ethereum block hash directly in, the substrate node will be like, yo, I don't have that block. And that's just because substrate hashes blocks differently than how Ethereum does it. So what we need and what we put right here in this thing called the aux store is a mapping between Ethereum style block hashes and substrate style block hashes. And it's just a little mapping that allows us to solve the problem. So a user calls in and says like, tell me information about this particular Ethereum block. And we look up in this map that's in the aux storage and we say like, okay, what's the corresponding substrate block hash? And now that we have that, we can just make the query the normal way. Like we can use all the existing plumbing within substrate to handle that. The trick is we just need this mapping between Ethereum block and substrate block. And so, like I said, we're gonna put it in the, the aux store and the, the uh, it's called auxiliary storage. The auxiliary storage is not like a super well-known part of substrate, but it's basically this, uh, I described it down here, um, like an off-chain scratch pad for the node to record any data that it likes. So it's important to understand that the auxiliary storage is not part of runtime storage. There's no consensus over it. My node can write things in its aux storage and they could be different things than what Jimmy's node writes and we'll never know about that. So that's important like when you're reasoning about the semantics of the data that you put in aux storage. And so, um, Basically, the deal is like every time a block comes in, whether we author the block ourselves or like, you know, some other node authors it and we hear about it across the network, we just need to update this mapping from Ethereum style hashes to substrate style hashes. Um, and I guess I should also say like, it's not just about block hashes, we're actually doing the same thing for transaction hashes as well. And so here's how we're gonna do it. When, a, you know, the, the description I gave was when a block comes in, we need to update this thing. And so there is a way in Substrate to hook into this like whenever a block comes in logic. And that thing is called the block import pipeline. That's the, the doc that I was recommending you could read earlier. And the way it works like just in the regular old Substrate node template is that the block import pipeline has two pieces of pipe. It has one for Aura and it has one for Grandpa. And the block import pipeline is typically used by consensus engines. They like use it really widely. All the ones that ship with substrate use it. Um, but it doesn't have to be only for consensus. It can also be for arbitrary data. And so we're going to use it in Frontier to update this aux storage block mapping, uh, 
like, yeah, block hash map. So the deal is like some block comes in across the network, it goes through the piece of the aura pipeline like it always does. Now it goes through our piece of the uh, frontier import pipeline. And that's where we say like, okay, here's some new block. I know it's hash because it's a block, I just hash it. And I know it's Ethereum style hash because that's stored in pallet Ethereum. So now that I know those two pieces of data, I just write it down to the aux store and then like, you know, pass the block through the rest of the block import pipeline. So, um, the aux store, you know, since it's not like a thing that's used that widely, I just want to sort of shed a little bit of light on it here while we're in seminar. So it's this like completely untyped storage thing. It's a place, it's a key value store where you can just write arbitrary key value associations that are just stored as vectors of bytes. So it's like totally untyped. You can write any serializable data there. Um, the the trouble is like, you know, using untyped data stores is like really dangerous and Rust is a language that really likes typed stuff and has a really strong typing system. And so instead of using this thing like super dangerously, we write accessor methods that allow us, so we call the methods and they handle the conversion to like VEC of bytes. So let me just kind of make that concrete by showing you the code here. So there's this file called um, aux schema. So aux means like this is about the auxiliary store and schema is like a general database word that means like the structure of your data. And um, so here's, let me just find a really good one. Here's one, this public function called write block hash. And we just give it a hash and then it does um, all of this stuff about like converting it into the, you know, doing the encoding and making it into the right byte types and all of that kind of stuff. It calls this helper function to like get the key, which is a complicated-ish thing. Here's the helper function that gets the key. Wait, where was that? Uh, this one, block hash key. So basically my point is like, none of this stuff is really hard in the sense of like, we have to reason with like advanced logic about it, but it's hard in the sense of like, if I make a typo here, I'm not gonna get any kind of compile error or warning. It's just gonna not work in a kind of like JavaScript-y or Python-y or like, you know, just dynamically typed language-y kind of way. So once we've constructed these like better typed accessor functions. Now we can use the aux storage in like a way more rustic kind of way. And I found it helpful to think about the aux store schema as if it were runtime storage. So it's not runtime storage. That's really important. The semantics are much different. But in terms of having like a place to store data and wanting it to be strongly typed, that is really similar with runtime storage. So I just came up with this like pseudo code here where I use the runtime's decal storage macro to declare the the aux store. So I want to be clear, like this code is not in Frontier. You can't use decal storage for the aux store. This is like a learning tool for us to help visualize it. And so there's two storage items. And the first one is this block hash mapping. Like I said, it's a, it's a map and it uses this particular like KCheck 256 hasher because that's the way that it's done in Ethereum. And in Ethereum, what they call a block hash, it's really actually just a hash of the header data. And then we map that to, it's a VEC because it's a one to many mapping to like um, the, the corresponding substrate block. So I tripped for a long time on like, why the heck is this a one to many mapping? And the idea is that when you have forks in your blockchain, it may be that like two different people authored a block at the same slot and they contain all the same transactions. So you'll have the same like underlying Ethereum block header and all that stuff, but there's two different corresponding substrate blocks. So that's the deal with this. And then the second one is a map of what we call metadata. And metadata is essentially, it's like, it's a map from a transaction hash, an Ethereum style transaction hash into a substrate style transaction hash. And then also the index of that transaction in the block. So like, if I call up with, um, if I call up with like, hey, here's a particular Ethereum transaction, then what this mapping gives me is, um, the substrate block that that transaction is in and which transaction is the block it is. So like, here's your block, it's the 10th transaction in this block. So let me pause there, that's a lot. So I'll take any questions about like aux schema or block import pipeline or just really anything else. Uh, there's no questions there, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's see. 
Uh, am I right that the source code in runtime palette should be as light as possible? The less logic, the better. Well, I mean, in general, like, yeah, as light as possible, I think is right. Like you want your runtime code to be performant, definitely, because every node on the network is going to run it a lot of times in WASM, which adds its own performance penalties. Um, what it doesn't mean, though, is it, what it means is like if there's logic that doesn't need to be run on chain, then don't run it on chain. That's that's great. Um, but if it does need to be run on chain, it has to be run on chain. Like you, you, for example, we, the EVM operations are probably the heaviest thing in our runtime and they can't be moved off chain because it's like literally the business logic of our runtime that we're trying to reach consensus over. So like, yeah, Tomas, you're definitely on the right track and like make it as light as possible. But like, obviously if something needs to go in the runtime, it needs to go in there. And then your goal is just to like optimize it as much as possible. Luckily for us, we already have a really nice EVM to use, so we didn't have to optimize that ourselves. Okay, so let's see, Alex is asking one too. Um, so the same Ethereum transaction can only be in one substrate block. So that's, uh, your intuition is correct about that. Oh, I, so, okay, let me think a lot about this. I guess you're asking because I showed the schema like this and we're mapping a transaction to a single block and it's indexed in that block. Uh, that's a good question, and that is definitely what this schema says, but now that you bring it up, I'm not 100% sure that that is a correct assumption, because like, uh, in the same forking situation I described earlier, like, the same transaction could be in two different blocks, and for like, literally exactly the same reason I described this as being a VEC. So that actually might be something that we need to, to fix eventually. Awesome question, Alex. Peer review for the win. <laughs> Uh, oh, let's see. Sam says oh, uh, you can. I, I'll have uh, a yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What was your question, Jimmy? Uh, so the auxiliary storage. Oh, the auxiliary storage is not uh, like uh, it's not passed around different nodes. Like so, there's no consensus about auxiliary storage. It's just like a local storage there. Uh, yeah, there local storage is a great way to say the, it. Yeah. Would, would there be a case that it will be inconsistent among different nodes? Oh, oh, does it, does it oh yeah, totally. In, in general, it will be different in cases like, you know, my node just authored a block and your node hasn't heard about it yet. So that in that case, it would definitely be different. Or like, um, it might even end up different in sort of a more long term way. Like if, uh, if my node authored a block and included it in the aux store, but then that block got like orphaned off before, um, you know, before all the other nodes heard of it. So my aux store would always contain information about that. But our what what we want of this data in Oxstore is not that it always be perfectly consistent, but that the parts that end up in the canon chain are available to nodes that need them. So actually, like you could run a node that didn't have the RPC exposed, so users couldn't call up and say like, "Tell me about this particular Ethereum block," and then you wouldn't even need that Frontier block import. That's just not a job your node is doing. But the idea is like, if your node is doing this RPC job, then it needs to have all the data about all the canon chain blocks in its aux store. I see, I see. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and it, oh, so like, I guess just to like introduce some people around the community. So like Sam and TG Mitchell on in the troll box here, those are Moonbeam guys also. So like uh, TG Mitchell, that's Telmo, who you might've seen at Sub-Zero. And he's really the guru about this aux storage stuff. So I'm glad he was here to answer the, Alex's question. Um, yeah, and I guess just for the video, the answer was like, yeah, we definitely want to make that second aux store thing one to many as well. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, okay. So I've motivated why we need that block import and like, uh, what it's going to be doing, namely like updating that aux store. So now let's actually like look at the code, um, maybe just to show the diagram again. Like I talked about adding this little piece of pipe here called frontier block import and, um, Anyone can define a chunk of the block import pipeline, just like anyone can define an unchecked extrinsic, or I mean, uh, unsigned extrinsic, like we saw earlier. And so, like, we'll just take a peek at that code. And this is this code is, it's part of Moonbeam because we have a dependency on Frontier. So this code lives primarily in Frontier. So let's go there. Um, oh wow! And I'm actually like, uh, oh no, this is this is the wrong spot. So let me close some tabs. And um, just to give you like context about how the Frontier repository is set up, we have um, this frame folder, which is where all the pallets live. There's only this pallet Ethereum here because for some reason pallet EVM um, lives with the substrate repo. 
I don't know if that'll be true forever, but that's how it is now. And then we have this RPC crate where we define our like RPC uh, endpoint. And we really didn't have any creativity in that. We just copied over exactly how it works in Ethereum. And then there's also in here the code that like implements the fetching of RPC data. And so like the, the way it works right now is what I described earlier, where you call up the RPC endpoint and then that calls into a runtime API to get the data out of the runtime. And uh, so let's see. Yeah, and the one I skipped over is called consensus. And so like my two cents is that consensus is really not a good name for this folder because it isn't about a consensus algorithm. It's not about like babe or grandpa or aura or proof of work or anything like that. The reason it has this name is because the block import pipeline is typically used by consensus. And this is our block import pipeline stuff. So um, I just want to encourage people to like keep this in mind. This is not like a consensus algorithm. This is just where our block import code lives. So let's just take a look at it here. I already showed you the aux schema. And now that we know the aux schema exists, we're never going to look at it again. We're just going to pretend like it's strongly typed and use it the way that we want to. Um, so, okay, here it is. Here's our struct called frontier block import. It has a couple of fields. One is important to understand because it's the very structure of the block import pipeline. So I showed you in the architecture diagram, this is like pipe after pipe after pipe. And we were able to just like squeeze this new frontier pipe segment in between the old aura and grandpa segments. And the way that we do that is that they're actually not structured like end to end here, like a list as I've shown them, they're structured more like an onion where each one wraps the next. So like the frontier block import has an inner block import, which is the grandpa one. And then the aura block import has an inner block import, which is the frontier one, which itself is around the grandpa one. So they kind of wrap each other in an onion like fashion. And so that's what the inner thing is all about. It says like anytime you're constructing a frontier block import, there may be another piece of the pipeline that comes next. And so that's what inner is for. And maybe before I even like talk about any of the rest of this stuff, I'll just show you in the implementation, which is uh right here, it's import block. The very last thing we do in import block is we call into the inner piece, the next piece of the pipelines import block. And so this is how blocks get passed from like, uh, passed down the import pipeline. So um, the other fields on our frontier block import pipeline, one is the client, which is the thing that just contains like all the, you know, block and transactions contains like all the storage backend and even some other stuff like uh, it would, that's how we would access the runtime APIs. I don't think we're doing that. Oh yeah, it looks like we are doing that here. Um, and then enabled is exactly what it sounds like. Um, you know, like sometimes you wanna disable this piece of the block import pipeline without having to like hack your code apart too much and like uh, recompile. So we just enable this. It's just a, just a flag for whether this does anything or not. You can see how it's implemented. Uh, wait, where is that? If enable. Uh, here. Yeah. Uh, one, three, one. No. one, three, one. Oh yeah, yeah, perfect, thanks. I was like, it's gotta be right around here somewhere. Yeah. So like if, if we disable the frontier block import, we just skip all of that and call straight to the inner. And so what we're doing in the frontier block import is this is the main function, this import block thing that we're, in right now, this import block function. And so what we do is basically we like extract some data that we need, uh, you know, including like the Ethereum style hash and, and that kind of stuff, the Ethereum style logs. And then, oh no, sorry, this is, yeah, this is actually really interesting. So, okay. Um, I don't know how in the weeds I wanna get, so I'll, I'll just say this. Every substrate block in its header has a field called digest. And the digest has a bunch of log items and the log items can be about pretty much anything. Most consensus algorithms use them. Um, other stuff also uses them. The runtime can add log items. And there's one in particular that we're going to construct in our runtime. I haven't showed you where that happens. I don't know if I will. We'll see how interesting it is. But there's this particular log called end block. And um, we're going to like, basically, we're going to find that log and then we're gonna take the data out of it. So let me try to say this articulately because I feel like I'm rambling. So 
Pallet Ethereum is responsible for calculating a bunch of Ethereum style data and storing it in the runtime. But we need that data also at this phase. This is the block import phase. Remember, we're in the block import pipeline. And the reason we need that data here is because we need to write that data to our aux schema. And in order to get the data from the runtime, from Pallet Ethereum to this phase, we need to attach it into this thing called a consensus log, an end block log in particular. And so um, if we have this kind of end block log, then we extract some data out of it, the Ethereum style block hash and the transaction hashes. And then we write to the auxiliary store, this is the one that does the block hash. And then for every transaction, Ethereum style transaction that was in there, we also write to the uh, second storage item, which just indexes the transactions. So um, I guess just to reiterate one more time, like this code runs every time we have a new block that our node knows about, whether we authored it or whether another node authored it and gave it to us. And so we say, okay, cool, new block, we add it to our database, and we also update that aux store by grabbing all the relevant data out of this consensus log. Is so that's there, a lot of plumbing. Let's take some questions. <laughs> is the consensus log and block is a, like a frontier Moonbeam specific, or it's also they also have it in subscript? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So um, let's let me show you some docs here. We'll start with like substrate.dev slash rust docs. And um, I'll take you like a, through a little tour of some of the data structures. And so the one I want to start with is just block. Or I, it might be called generic block actually. Dang. <laughs> okay. We'll find that somehow. Oh, here it is. SP runtime generic block. So it's called an abstraction over a substrate block. And this is what like basically every single substrate chain uses, including Moonbeam and including the node template in Polkadot. And the a substrate block has two fields. It has a header and it has the extrinsics. And the extrinsics is just a vector of like all these transactions. So let's take a look at the header here. Oh, I thought it was gonna let me like click on that link. Oh, uh, Okay, um, there's, there's this trait called header and we have an implementation called generic header. So I'll just try to find it. I don't know why that's not linked. So here it is, SP runtime generic header. And so in a header, we have the parent hash. That's what makes a blockchain, the block height or block number as they call it, state root, extrinsics roots, and then digest. This is the thing that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And its type is gonna be one of these like digest things. And it has a bunch of logs. Those are the logs I was talking about. And so you can see it's a vector, that's why it's plural, logs, and each log is one of these digest items. And so here it is, it's an enum with several variants, and one of them is consensus. So if we flip back to like the frontier code here, um, you can see we're matching on uh, consent, oh, wait a second. Uh, let me get myself fully oriented here real quick. Um, I wanted to see where this consensus log type came from. Frontier consensus primitives. So my, what I thought I was showing you, and now that I'm wondering, now that I'm seeing it, I might be wrong, but I thought what was happening was that we were getting one of these consensus variants, and then inside we would have this, um, this one that's specific to Frontier, this Frontier consensus log. So let's, let's see how, how accurate that is. Um, so here it is, consensus log. It's an enum. I think that's because like, you know, uh, like to do, there may be more here eventually, but right now there's not. So it's always going to be end block. And um, oh yeah, and we give it a consensus engine ID, F-R-O-N. So I think that is what's going on here. Like for consensus log, we always give it an engine ID and then this like opaque thing that's inside and that opaque thing will be this consensus log. I do confess, I don't see exactly where that's all plumbed together right now, but I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. So Jimmy, I think your question was like, how much of this is just substrate stuff and how much of it is like frontier slash moonbeam stuff. And so this whole concept of like logs and digest items and even this consensus variant, that's all general substrate stuff. And then this particular end block one, that is all frontier stuff and Moonbeam uses it directly as it's written in frontier. We haven't customized that at all. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, good question. Let's see, do we have any others from the audience? Not right now, okay, cool.
Oh, let's see, there's one here. Uh, Telmo says, the header digest is fed with the consensus log and the function is retrieving that from the digest. Okay, yeah, cool, perfect. Um, okay, so like I would be like more than happy to dive deeper there or like answer questions about it or anything like that. Or another thing we could do is just like uh, tackle that um, like bonus topic that I had mentioned. I don't know, what do you think, Jimmy? I'm pretty, pretty much down for anything. Uh, from Sam. Oh, we got a new, oh, okay, all right, yeah, let's see. Uh, from Sam, what's the use of consensus log? So yeah, like in general, um, the consensus log, it says like a message from the runtime to the outside or to the consensus engine. Uh, this should never be generated by the native code of any consensus engine, but this is not checked yet. So it's, it's exactly what we were saying we wanted. We wanted a way for Palette Ethereum or, you know, more generally like something in the runtime to pass information to the outer part of the node at the block import phase. And, um, and so that's exactly what it is. It, Palette EVM passes that piece of information, which here is just an opaque vector. But then when we're in the frontier block import pipeline, we actually know how to decode it um, because like, uh, oh, I thought, I thought that happened down here. Let's see. Um, oh, I guess, uh, yeah, let's see. I guess it must be not opaque, but this is the part that I don't understand. I don't understand where it gets like non-opaque. I think that's what Telmo was talking about. Um, but I, I hope that maybe answered your question, Sam. That's like what the consensus log is used for in general. I'll show you these docs. So let me read what Telmo says here again. Palette Ethereum to the digest set to block import to digest get. Oh, uh, I almost feel like Telmo can, this is a big ask, man, but are you willing to like come on screen and tell us a little bit about that? Because I feel like I don't know what the digest get is and everything. Are you okay with that, Jimmy? Sure. Uh, okay, let's let's see what he says. Or just or just invite him. <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm searching for his name. Okay. T G Mitchell. T G Mitchell. Well, I don't see his name here. Yeah. Oh, he's okay. Doesn't have a setup now. No problem. That's okay. That's okay. Um, but actually, so like, I, I don't think I explicitly said this yet, but like my goal with this um, tutorial that we've kind of been referencing is that it will be like, it's not the case now, but my goal is that it will be complete enough to kind of like walk people who have enough prerequisite substrate knowledge through like all of this detailed Ethereum and Frontier stuff that we're talking about now. So that, you know, that can definitely be addressed in here once it, I understand it in full detail. So, um, yeah, so, so here's, here's like a new topic that I think we can switch to that I found interesting. And maybe just to set the context, there's this, um, there's this like adage in Substrate Runtime Development that's been around since before I was even involved. I think the first place I heard it was from Sean, and he was like one of the first people building palettes. So it's been around a long time. And the adage is verify first, write second. And the idea is that transactions will come into your runtime and some of them will be valid and some of them won't. And they could be invalid for all kinds of reasons. Like, um, uh, let's just give a concrete example. Let's say it's a voting DAP and you've already cast your vote. If you send a second vote, I mean, you know, like depending on um, what your voting algorithm is and everything, but let's just say like one, one person, one vote or something, and you've already cast your vote. So you try to send your second one, that transaction needs to fail. And so the adage verify first, right second is basically like check whether the person has already voted. And if they have fail the transaction immediately, and only if they haven't, then go on to mutating storage, you know, like incrementing whoever's count they voted for or something. And it really makes a lot of sense in almost every context, like the voting algorithm one that I said just now, because like, obviously you don't want to like <laughs> count the vote if it's invalid, or you don't want to like, you know, let's say I'm trying to send Jimmy tokens and I send him more than I have. You don't want to like give Jimmy the cho tokens, then realize that I don't have enough and then cancel the transaction because he already got his money. Um, so it, it makes sense in almost every case. And I was working on this bug that I found in Frontier the other day, and I believe that it might be an opportunity, or not an opportunity, like a, a use case to violate that, um, that principle that if the transaction is going to fail, it shouldn't be mutating storage. So let me dig up the PR to give everybody like full context. 
it's made directly against Frontier. And, oh, wow, that's big. Um, oh yeah, it's this very first one. So, oops. Um, so here's the link for you. And here's the context. This is about Power of Ethereum. And I've told you guys what Power of Ethereum does and why. I haven't told you that much about the details though. So in Ethereum network, every time you submit a transaction, you're expecting to get a transaction receipt back. And what that means is that like, you call the Ethereum RPC to send your transaction, and then later you can call the, another RPC with your transaction hash requesting a receipt. And a receipt is something that confirms that the network has seen and processed your transaction and tells you whether it succeeded or not. So even if your transaction is like fails, you're still supposed to get a receipt. So imagine I try to send more funds than I have or like um, vote twice or just like any of those examples, I'm still supposed to get a transaction receipt that says, you know, sorry, that thing failed. And the way that we handle transaction receipts in Palette Ethereum is the following. I'll show you the code. Uh, oh, this is a frontier thing. So here we are back in Palette Ethereum source lib. And let me just show you its storage items. It has a few. Um, one is called pending. And it says like the current building blocks, transactions, and receipts. So uh, yep, let me just leave it at that. And then it also has this one like current block, current receipts, and current transaction statuses. So as transactions, as these Ethereum style transactions are processed, you might remember they're coming into this transact function and we are executing them against the EVM. And as we do that, we're putting all of this data um, you know, about like what was the transaction, what was its status, what is its receipt into this pending item. And then at the end of the block, we iterate through uh, the pending item and we move this data into these individual storage items. We like, there's, there's more processing than that. Like the Ethereum style block actually gets built in on finalize. The receipts just get copied over into here. And so then the way it works is that when someone calls up saying, yo, give me my transaction receipt, we call, you know, that goes to the RPC, calls into a runtime API, calls into Palette Ethereum, and digs up the receipt out of here. That's how it's supposed to work, and that's how it does work for good transactions that succeed. But for transactions that revert, we have so far followed this like a substrate best practice of verify first and write later. And so when the transaction reverts, we don't mutate storage. And what that means is we don't put any of the details into this pending storage item. And what that means is the transaction receipt never makes it here into the current receipts. And so um, the PR I made actually changes that so that even when the transaction fails, we still write all of its data into this pending storage item. And then only after we've written it into pending, then we fail the transaction. And I think that's the right thing to do because it's the only way I see to get the, you know, the transaction receipt that says like, yo, sorry, your transaction failed back into this correct storage item. But I, I'm not presenting it here as a like, hey, here's something that I know is right. I'm presenting it because I want someone like Alex to tell me why that's bad or like what I missed or, you know, I'm, I guess I'm saying like I'm presenting it for, for peer review here. So I'm curious if people have thoughts to share about that so or, or just Ethereum, questions about it. In, in Ethereum mainnet, uh, like when it fell, it also have generate a, a new receipt. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's right. And so the, like a lot of ecosystem tools, like MetaMask, for example, MetaMask is how we discovered this bug. They'll like submit your transaction. And, you know, if we're talking about like Ethereum mainnet, we're talking about like 15 second blocks. And if you don't have high fees, you might be waiting several blocks. And so what MetaMask does is it just like intermittently pulls the node saying like, hey, is there a transaction receipt for this thing yet? Is there a transaction receipt for this thing yet? And it does some helpful things for the user. Like if there's no transaction receipt after a certain amount of time, like maybe a minute or two, then it broadcasts the transaction again. Like I think just in case it got dropped on the network or whatever. But so what we were seeing was that MetaMask would submit the transaction. It would fail as it was supposed to, but then MetaMask would never get the transaction receipt. And so it would think that that wasn't included in a block and it would keep resubmitting it and resubmitting it. And then the, you know, the transaction pool would say like, yo, we already processed this one. And then eventually the node would ban the transaction. So that's like kind of the context. 
it, it, it sounds like it it sounds it makes sense to me to to write their transaction hash back. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to sort of share that, and um, you know, we'll we'll see how it uh, how it works out. We'll see like whether specifically Wei wants to merge that into Frontier, and I'm sure if if uh, if not, he's going to have some good reason that I didn't think of, and I'll I'll get to learn something. So you guys yeah. already have some discussion there. It, it seems. In that oh regard. yeah, that's true. Yeah, let's. Well, let's see. Let's look at it. Um, me and so this is Alan. He's another Moonbeam guy, and the discussion here is like things that I agree with, just about like improving the quality of the tests that I wrote and everything, um, and asking like why I structured them. Oh wow, this is news to me. I didn't see this. Okay, still cannot return error here. It must exceed because at this stage the runtime state has already changed. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, awesome. So I, I have more to learn about this already. It seems like he found a way to, to fix it uh, already. So that's that's great. Yeah. So, um, okay, yeah, I think uh, that's like pretty much all I have. I'd be happy to like take more questions and stuff, but if not, we can we can end here too. I guess like uh, maybe while people are typing questions, I'll just say like, if this kind of stuff interests you, or if you're a substrate developer, um, Moonbeam is hiring, or I should say Pure Stake, that's our like, company, is hiring Moonbeam developers. So um, just go to moonbeam.network and check it out. And then also, like this coming weekend, November 6th and 7th, um, uh, me and Alberto, who's on our team, but mostly Alberto, is going to be presenting at TruffleCon. So Truffle is some tooling in the Ethereum ecosystem, and we're going to show off how you can sort of like use it seamlessly with Moonbeam and everything. So if that's up your alley, you should check it out. Alberto's a really good presenter, and I'll be kind of like backup for in case we get substrate questions. Yeah. All right. I don't know. What do you think, Jimmy? You got any updates for us? <laughs> what have you been up to? Uh, I, I was in Shanghai in the, in the past three weeks. So uh, two weeks for quarantine, uh, staying in the hotel uh, and doing some coding and some preparation. And then the past week, I like like we had so actually we had three events happening uh, like all in a row. The first one is a demo day. So we mm -hmm. we had a boot camp. Uh, so we selected mm -hmm. fifteen teams, and then it had been already like we have already been like following them and together for four months. Uh, four months it was like five months, and then they. So together with some, like Akala is one of them. Yeah, Akala is one of them. And, and, mm -hmm. and the Plasm network, yeah. And, yeah, and then, yeah, we were talking about Plasm earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's cool. And then they, so, so they reached a certain milestone and then they, they all presented uh, to, to, uh, to the audience. And then there was another event by uh, one of the famous blockchain lab in China. It's called Wanxiang Blockchain Lab. So. Mm -hmm. They, they, so they have two day events there, and then the Web three forums that held by the Web three foundations. So I and the whole like the Parity Asia team are helping out there. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Sounds yeah. fun. Yeah. Sounds fun, except for the two weeks of in prison. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, of, yeah, quarantine definitely is important. Was it's it tough? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. It's another another kind of practice for me. Like like I can I can be more focused. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm good to wrap it there. Thanks a lot for hosting me, oh, Jimmy. I really okay. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah. And thank you, audience, for for participating. So I'll like we'll see each other. Uh, if you have any questions, continue. Let's continue our discussion in in the uh, Element channel. All right. Yeah. Um, yep. Exactly. Bye. Yeah. Bye.